Thank you very much, Sasha, for a kind introduction of me. And uh, it's my great pleasure, and uh, really, I thank to Sasha and Ali for, kind, for giving me such a you know, wonderful opportunity to visit this beautiful campus of Chapelville to give a talk. Uh, I think that several years ago, the Leaf invited me here at uh, some symposium to give a talk, but at that time, unfortunately, I have a conflict to, you know, schedule, so I couldn't make it, but now, today, I made it. So thank you very much. So today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the uh, uh, block of polymer myself, how the utilizing this for the nano carrier for targeting drug delivery. So I'm from an uh, uh, engineering school here. So uh, I organized this lecture, a little bit a touch of engineering. That is a fantastic voyage in our body by this big. So uh, I think some of you, uh, maybe uh, uh, most of the people here is a very young age, so maybe uh, you didn't understand this movie, but uh, this is the title of the I think you know, the scientific fiction movie in 1960s. Uh, at that time, I was a high school boy, high school student, and I was so excited to see this movie. So in this uh, movie, the medical doctors and their big goods are shrunk into very, very small size and sent it to our body through intravenous route. And then the, they, you know, the, uh, reach to the disease, disease site to, to repair. So this is a kind of ultimate targeted therapy. So even now, you, you cannot, uh, you know, the shrunken the medical doctor in this size. However, maybe we can make a remote controlled vehicle which can snake into the all over your body and reach to the target site and prepare the disease uh, from the inside of our body. However, even in this case, that you should make this vehicle to be very, very small uh, maybe less than 100 nanometer in the size of virus. So in, this, in that case, you cannot prepare this uh, vehicle by the conventional uh, machinery approach. That means that uh, assembling the gear or cutting the board. So instead, we can, we, we propose the different way of constructing this kind of small vehicles or maybe we can call this nanomachines, by self-assembly of molecular-engineered synthetic macromolecules. So as shown here, the, we can molecular engineer to integrate the desired functionality into primary structure of synthetic macromolecules. So the macromolecules we are working on is block copolymers. Uh, I think that, uh, of course, uh, people in the Polymer field are well known about what is block copolymers, but uh, maybe some of them, some of you are not so familiar with that. So I would like to explain a little bit what is block copolymers. That is a polymer conjugated with two distinct blocks, or maybe more than sometimes two or sometimes three. So in this case, a hydrophilic block and hydrophobic block. And we utilize polyethylene glycol mainly as a hydrophilic block because polyethylene glycol is very hydrophilic and biocompatible. And for the hydrophobic block, we use polyamine acids because polyamine acids is biodegradable and biocompatible, and you can easily manage the properties just by changing the chemical structure of side chain from hydrophobic to hydrophilic or maybe anionic to cationic. So uh, in this uh, polymer strands, we integrate a function like a sensing that is ability to selectively bind target Operation, that is ability to execute diagnostics and therapy, and processing ability to change structure responding to stimuli. That is a very important functionality to construct supramolecular nanomachines. So after integrating this kind of functions, we just put these macromolecules in a aqueous entity uh, in the presence sometimes with drug nucleic acid or any other bioactive substances, and then this spontaneously self-assemble into a four-shell structures, which we call block copolymer micelles, or, or more aggressive way, maybe we can call this supramolecular nanomachines. So the structure is quite simple. The functionality core is totally surrounded by hydrophilic 
and biocompatible polishing glyco layer to make this uh, object to be quite sta stable and stealth property in blood circulation. So structure is quite simple, but by utilizing this uh, uh, devices or nano machines, we can do a lot of things. For example, uh, targeting the small metastatic cancer. Uh, here is a lymphatic metastasis, you can see here. But by utilizing a light emitting nano machine, that means that the nano machine labeled with fluorescence dye, you can clearly observe that this nano machine exactly accumulate to the location of lymphatic metastasis. And they can crossing the blood brain tumor barrier, which I will, uh, disc I will address in detail later. So here is the inside of the brain tumor. So it's totally dark. And this yellow uh, vessels, this are the capillaries. But after five hours, you can see here some red, reddish colors inside of the brain tumor. That is, uh, this uh, broccopolymer micelles can translocate into the inside of brain tumor and eventually to regress the brain tumor like here. And you can visualize the diseased site in spatial temporal manner. Of course, uh, you can detect a small tumor, but even you can score in the malignancy. So you can see here some uh, brown regions here. That is a region corresponding to the lower the pH. And in the tumor, lower the pH region usually about more aggressive tumors. And converting the physical energy to therapeutic modality. So after accumulating this uh, nano machine into target organ, you can activate the drug by physical energy, including light, ultrasound, or any other physical energy sources. So by utilizing this weapon, we are now challenging to eradicate the cancers interactable by current therapy. So there are four categories. The number one is a metastatic cancer. That is a major cause of death by cancer. So that is a very, uh, very crit critical issue. And second is a drug inaccessible cancer, such as pancreatic and brain cancers. And third is a drug resistant cancer and cancer stem cells. So I would like to start my talk from treatment of drug-resistant cancer. And in my talk, I would like to mainly focus on one example of our broccopoima micelles loaded with platinum-based drugs, cisplatin or dahaplatin. So here's the structure of dahaplatin. That is a second-generation platinum drug. So because of the cyclohexyl ring, this drug is almost insoluble in water. So you cannot use this compound as a drug. So to increase the solubility, the prodrug of, of dahaplatin are in clinical use, that called oxyplatin. So in this way, you can increase the solubility. However, this oxyplatin acid moiety may cause the neural toxicities. And anti-tumor activity of this compound is not so uh, sufficient to treat several intractable tumors. So we would like to increase the potency of this drug with decreasing side effects by loading into polymeric micelles. So the whole procedure is quite simple. Just mixing this polyacetyl glycol polyl glutamic acid block copolymer with dahaplatin in the aqueous solution. So in this way, it undergoes the ligand exchange reaction of this carboxylate group with nitrate group of this dahaplatin. And you can selectively conjugate this dahaplatin in monodentate form in the side chain of erucutane. Then this induces the very nice alpha helix structure formation of this erucutane. And this alpha helix bundle then secondary associate to form polymeric micelles with a very narrow distribution with a size of around 30 nanometers. So because of this bundle structure association, this micelle is very, very stable, even in the very diluted conditions, and can survive during the 
blood circulation. So, indeed, this is the plasma platinum concentration. In case of the gear platinum, they quickly excrete from kidney. However, in case of the daha platinum micelle, we do observe the very longevity in blood circulation. And even after 48 hours, still 10% of initial dose still circulate in the blood compartments. And eventually, we got a very high accumulation to tumor, as shown here. At this time point, it's almost 20-fold increase. And if you compare by the cumulative amount, it's the difference is more than 100 times. And this very significant accumulation to compare to low molecular compound is due to the well-known enhanced permeability and retention effect, as schematically shown here. That means that the Here's a tumor capillary. The tumor capillary has a very many openings and very leaky structures. So the, the long circulation carrier like micelles can easily penetrate into tumor to have a very high accumulation. On the other hand, the, in a the healthy tissue, the capillary structure is very tight, totally covered by tight endothelial layer and backed by continuous basement membrane. So because of this, the micelle cannot penetrate into healthy tissue, but this is an advantage, and eventually decrease the side effects due to non-specific accumulation. Uh, however, the small drugs still can penetrate into healthy tissue by simple diffusion to cause many awful side effects. And because of this high accumulation, of course, you can expect a high anti-tumor efficacy, as shown in this example here. This is a treatment of human colon cancer. And compared to oxyzole platin, the haplatin micelle shows a much higher anti-tumor efficacy, even with a half dose to oxyzole platin. And interestingly, this efficacy still preserves for the treatment of oxyzole platin resistant colon cancer, shown here. So this is a oxyzole platin resistant tumor cells. So oxyzole has no more efficacy. However, the micelle still shows a significant anti-tumor efficacy compared to oxyzole even for the treatment of this kind of resistant tumor cells. And in terms of the biodistribution, both tumor is totally same. So, there's no, no, so this difference is not due to the difference in tumor accumulation, but more due to the pharmacodynamics. That means that the uh, difference in intracellular trafficking. So indeed, when we compare the IC50 value, uh, in case of the oxyzole there's a 10 times increase in IC50 compared in case of the resistant tumor cells compared to the original tumor cell. However, in case of the micelle, there's no difference in this value. Means the micelle successfully circumvent the resistance of tumor cells. So we hypothesize this is due to the difference in intracellular trafficking. So oxyzole this is a small compound, so it can directly penetrate or through the copper transporter to accumulate in cytoplasm. However, the, this type of the tumor cells, platinum resistant tumor cells, usually overexpress the sulfur compounds like methionine synthase and metallocyanin and glutathione. So this oxyzole active form of oxyzole easily inactivated in the cytoplasm by these sulfur, uh, sulfur compounds, and eventually they cannot crossing the DNA in nucleus. However, in case of the micelles, this is just like a nanoscale Trojan host and enter into the cell by the process called endocytosis. And through this process, then eventually they accumulate in the perinuclear region to release the drugs, and this uh, active of the daha platin can easily penetrate into the nucleus to effectively crossing DNA. And this, this is a quite reasonable uh, assumption because we know that there is a significant pH drop occurs from early endosome in the uh, periphery of the cell around pH 6.9 to late endosome in the perinuclear region to pH 5.5. So when we compare the 
release profile at these two conditions, there's a significant difference. At the condition mimicking the early endosome, there is almost no drug release or cause. However, the condition corresponding to late endosome, we do observe a very fast and significant release of active compound from this micellar systems. And importantly, the, this kind of resistant mechanism is well known to exist also for the cancer stem cells. The many types of cancer stem cells usually overexpress glutathione, and eventually it has a very strong resistance to platinum compounds. Now, but however, this is just a test tube experiment. So we would like to see this behavior really occurs inside of the tumor cells. So to track that process, we prepare the light emitting polymeric micelles shown here. So in this case, we conjugate the green fluorescence, fluorescence dye at the periphery of the fluorescent glycol, and red fluorescence dye at the chain end of polyglutamate and prepared micelles. So in this case, the red fluorescence dye are accumulated in the core of the micelles and eventually totally quenched. So the intact micelles only show the green fluorescence. However, when micelles disintegrate to release the drugs, then we, do, we should observe the red fluorescence from the micelles. So or the merged color of green and red should be yellow or orange. So by utilizing this kind of fluorescence tucked micelles, we track the intratumor penetration and cellular internalizations. So here is a movie of cultured tumor cells. So this is a, a tumor cells, and this is the time, and you can see some green fluorescence here. That means the internalization of intact micelles. And then time goes on to more than 50 hours. Now you can clearly observe the orange color inside of the, each of the tumor cells corresponding to the disintegration of micelles. Now, this is a in vitro study. So maybe you ask me, so how about in, 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 in vivo? So we move next into direct observation of the behaviors in in vivo situations. So to track what's going on in in vivo, we need a special instrument that is a rapid scanning confocal microscopy, uh, which is developed by Nikon. So this is a Japanese technology. So the point of this system is that the rapid scanning. So compared to the you know uh, you know usual confocal microscopy, we can in this case that is a very rapid scanning mode. So even animals are breathing, we can still obtain a very clear three-dimensional confocal image by this instrument, which I will show you one example here. This is a xenografted tiny, tiny tumor with a size around two millimeters. But still, this is a, a Z-stacked image, but you can still observe each of the nucleus of GFP-expressing tumor cells, and this yellow vessel is a capillary. So by utilizing this instrument, we can easily chase the nanoscale Trojan force behavior inside of the tumors. Now, just after the injection, this is inside of the tumor of the living animals. You can see the this is the capillary. Inside is totally green, means that the intact micelles stably circulate in the capillary. And this uh, dark objects are corresponding to erythrocytes. So that means that the micelle doesn't have any interaction with erythrocytes. Then after 12 hours, with a higher magnification, still inside the blood vessel is still green. That means that the still intact micelles uh, circulate in the blood compartment. But you can see inside of the tumor, now you see each of the cancer cells, which inside shows a yellow to orange fluorescence, clearly. So this means that this corrosion force can snake into the tumor mass and deliver the active compound in each of the cells in the tumor tissues. So this is a direct observation. So that means that the important message here is that not only simple accumulation, we can expect the effective penetration into tumor mass by utilizing this kind of systems. So based on this results, we then tackle to treat the 
very intractable cancer, that is a pancreatic cancer. The five-year survival rate is very low. So one of the reasons is that uh, limited drug accumulation because of the hypovascularity and sick fibrosis. So here is a, a, a pathological section of human pancreatic cancer model. The important, the structure is very, very heterogeneous. Now, here is a, this dark blue region is a cancer segment, which is totally surrounded by thick red stroma. And let me remind you that the vessel only exists inside of the stroma. There is no vessel in the cancer cells. So that means that the even drug extravasate from vasculature, still if they need to get through this sick stroma to reach the final target of cancer cells. Eventually, here is an example of the liposome accumulation with a size of 100 nanometer to this pancreatic tumor, and you can see here all the 100 nanometer liposome are all stuck only in the vicinity of capillaries and never getting to the tumor cells. So one of the advantages of self-assembly system is that you, we can easily manage the size. So we downsizing our polymeric micelles and see what happens by intravital microscopy. So in this experiment, 30 nanometer sized micelles are labeled by green fluorescence, and 70 nanometer micelles are labeled with red fluorescence, and then mixed together to inject. So eventually, the inside of the capillary, as you see here, the color is totally yellow, because of the mixed color of green and red. But you can see inside of pancreas, pancreatic cancer is totally green. That means that only 30 nanometer micelles can penetrate deeply into pancreatic tumors. So where are the red micelles? They all stuck in the vicinity of capillaries, just like liposomes. So this result clearly shows that size modulation is quite important to, to manage this kind of uh, intractable tumor with very thick stroma. So we further confirm this by another methodology, that is the uh, uh, X-ray fluorescence. So we brought this uh, pathological sp specimen into our huge synchrotron facility in Japan called the Spring 8. The reason is that by this synchrotron, we can, this uh, synchrotron is a source of the very strong X-ray. So we guided this strong X-ray directly here into X-ray microscope to carry out the microsynchrotron radiation X-ray fluorescence. That is an elemental analysis. So under this microscopy, we can easily identify each of the cancer cells because as I mentioned, there's no, no vasculature, means no hemoglobin, and no ion. So the region with very low ion signal corresponding to each of the cancer cells. Then in the same region, we observe the distribution of platinum. And there's a big difference between 30 nanometer micelle and 70 nanometer micelle. In case of the 70 nanometer micelle, there's almost no platinum signal inside of the cancer cell nest. However, in case of the 30 nanometer micelle, we do observe the significant accumulation of platinum, even inside of the tumor cell nest. No, no, this is a, this is a tumor cell nest. It's not single tumor cell. Yeah. The size of this is 50 microns. So, so this result shows that the, the platinum drug can easily penetrate uh, inside of the tumor cell nest. And eventually, here is a treatment of xenograft tumor. Uh, as expected, only 30 nanometer micelle shows a uh, very high anti-tumor efficacies. And 50 and 70 nanometer micelle doesn't show efficacies in this case. However, this result is only obtained by xenograft. So in a cancer biology, there are many discussions about the importance of tumor models in cancer translation research. So you usually start from the xenograft model and then go to orthotopic model. It's much similar to the human case. However, even in this case, these models are still different from actual situation in humans. The blood vessel is different. 
strom and immune cells are different, they are nude cells, nude mass, so totally different from human fish. So we, that means that uh, we, need the, we need the exact tumor models that better reflect the state of cancer in human. That is very important. So we, mo we moved to use the different tumor model. That is a spontaneous pancreatic cancer model by genetically modified mouse. So in this mouse model, that naturally developed pancreatic cancer because the, in a downstream of tissue specific promoter, there is a gene encoding photoproteins and oncogenes. So these poor mice, 100%, you know, develop pancreatic cancer, and we can easily observe the progress of pancreatic cancer progression by IVIS measurement, and also this undergoes a peritoneal metastasis and liver metastasis, which is quite similar and reproducing pancreatic cancer situation in humans. So first, we verify, even for this model, which is very similar to human case, still whether we observe the EP effect. So this is the results. Now, the accumulation of mice cells was lower than free drug in the wild type mice, as shown here. WT, this is a healthy mice. So there's a decrease in uh, uh, mice cell accumulation to free drug. However, in a transgenic mice, TG, we do observe the significant increase in the mice accumulation to pancreas with tumors. This is not the pancreas tumor. This is a pancreas including tumors. But however, even in this case, we clearly observe the mice reduce accumulation in healthy pancreas and increase accumulation to pancreas with tumors. And further, this is a pathological uh, uh, examination. This is a PCAM1, which uh, labels a vasculature. And this is a mice cells, and this is over. So that means that the mice cells were accumulated in the pancreatic tumor region of this transgenic mice. And the, here is the uh, uh, X-ray fluorescence results. And upper panel shows the uh, healthy region of pancreas. And lower panel is a tumor region of pancreas. And you can clearly observe, compared to the healthy region, there's a significant accumulation of platinum into the tumor region of this transgenic mice pancreas. So that means that uh, uh, even for this kind of model, we clearly observe the EPR effect. And here's the result of the treatment. In this case, we measure the survival. So compared to the observed platinum and control, we do clearly observe the significant improvement in survival of this uh, mice treated with mice, mice cells. In this case, 100% survival even after 70 days of uh, observation. And usually, as I mentioned, this pancreatic tumor undergoes the metastasis to peritoneal cavity to develop ascites, as shown here. But compared to oxyl protein treated mice, the mice treated uh, mice doesn't observe this kind of ascite development. And here is a, a quantitative data of metastasis. And compared to saline and oxyproplatin, there's a significant decrease in liver metastasis, metastasis to digestive tract, and ascites. And even more, this is a change in the cell marker. After the treatment with mice, there's a significant drop into the CA99, that is a serum marker of pancreatic tumors. So that means that uh, by treatment of this mice uh, drugs, we can successfully treat the, this very intractable, spontaneous pancreatic tumor. And this is an animal study, but I would like to emphasize that already the similar mice cells, which is a cisplatin mice cell, are in a clinical trial for a phase three clinical trial for pancreatic cancer patients. And we do observe that the mice have significantly extended survival compared to standard therapy. Uh, standard therapy, usually the median survival is only three months, but patients treated with this mice case, we observe uh, extension survival 
sometimes more than one year. So I would, I would like to move to the next topic, that is the treatment of metastatic cancer. So that is a major cause of cancer death. The surgical operation, radiation therapy, this is a major treatment procedure for treatment of cancer. However, unfortunately, they are not applicable for invisible small metastasis. So we definitely need chemotherapy or targeting therapy to treat uh, metastasis, especially the lymphatic metastasis. So for this issue, we utilize the also topic serous gastric tumor model because this serous gastric cancer survival is very low and as same as the pancreatic cancer, it has a very sick fibrosis and often undergoes a lymph node metastasis. So we utilize this model to whether this mice can treat this kind of metastasis. So this is a treatment of the, uh, uh, the original tumor. Again, the 30 nanometer mice shows a very significant efficacy against this orthotopic tumors. And this is accumulation. 30 nanometer mice shows a very significant accumulation to this serous gastric cancer. And how about the lymphatic metastasis? This is the accumulation. Now, again, 30 nanometer mice shows a very significant accumulation to metastatic, metastatic lymph node compared to 70 nanometer mice and oxaplatin. And eventually, this is a weight of lymph node. So, com compared to control 70 nanometer mice oxaplatin, there's a significant uh, uh, decrease or no increase in the uh, lymphatic. Uh, weight of lymph node compared to the uh, initial stage. That means that uh, we can successfully suppress the lymphatic metastasis by utilizing this kind of micro systems. So this is a very promising uh, result. We believe that uh, that is a uh, one very important direction of uh, medicine is that uh, they can treat the in invisible small metastasis and eventually I, uh, can reduce the uh, mortality of, five of cancer of many types. Now, I would like to mention about uh, the transcendental research of our polymeric mice drugs. Uh, there are three examples here. Uh, one is a paclitaxel, that is a very the high potency drug uh, for the treatment of breast and lung cancers, but problem is neurotoxicity and allergy. And cisplatin, as I mentioned, that is used very widely, but nausea and nephrotoxicity is quite big problem. So because of this, uh, always patients are required to have hydration, and because of this, all the patients usually should be hospitalized. And in case of the epilobicin, that is good for the treatment of breast and gastric cancers and lymphoma. However, problem is cardiotoxicities. And by inclusion of these drugs into polymeric micelles, of course, all the case, we always have the enhanced efficacy. But more than that, in case of the paclitaxel, by micelle formulation, we circumvent the neurotoxicity. And for the cisplatin case, this is a creatinine uh, uh, um, uh, concentration. In case of the cisplatin, there's a significant increase in the creatinine. However, in the micro case, it stays in the normal range. And this is a, uh, uh, the normal, that is a cardiac toxicity. And compared to epilobicin, the micro case is also in a normal range. So because of this, in a protocol of clinical trial, in case of the paclitaxel mycels, uh, uh, we are treating patients without anti-allergic drugs. And for the cisplatin case, protocol is that all outpatient care without hospitalization because we don't need any uh, hydration. And higher efficacy with reduced cardiotoxicity is expected 
for the epilepsy myself. And here is some of the outcome for corporate sponsored clinical trials. The public access myself are phase three clinical trial that showed a significant outcome against breast cancer and reduced neurotoxicity and without use of any anti-allergic drugs. And in case of the cisplatin phase three clinical trial, a significantly extended survival of late pancreatic cancer patients and significant reduce of nausea and nephrotoxicity and almost no hydration. So all the patients are outpatients. And for epilepsy, that is a phase one clinical trial, and we are expecting to prevent drug-induced cardiotoxicity, so we can have a much longer treatment of breast cancer and lymphoma. So this is a, a scheme of the challenge to our unclimbed summit of nanomedicine. So as I mentioned, that epilobicin myself just started uh, phase three last year. And this epilobicin myself is quite interesting uh, structure because this is a, a pH sensitive myself. So we conjugate uh, doxorubicin or epilobicin through pH sensitive hyazozon linker. So myself is quite stable at the pH 7.4, but once it's internalized into the acidic compartment of the cancer cells, they liberate the active compound epilobicin selectively inside of the tumors. And dahaplatin is in a, a final stage of phase one and just start a phase one two clinical trial in MD Anderson Cancer Center in USA. And irinotecan myself, that is in a also final stage of phase two, that also clinical trial undergoing in USA. And uh, cisplatin myself, as I mentioned, that is quite effective for the treatment of pancreatic cancer and we start uh, phase three last year in Asia, Taiwan, Singapore, and Korea. And for the paclitaxel myself, it's already started phase three in Japan, and uh, we are expecting to apply for approval in 2015. So that means that uh, uh, five different formulations are now priming this uh, summit of nanomedicine uh, from our laboratories. And these are the first generation mice. And of course, we are also challenging to develop the, what we call second generation mice for the treatment of drug inaccessible cancer, the brain cancer. The, most of the cancer, we can expect the EPR. However, some type of cancer, for example, glioblastoma, they have a very high barrier, which we call blood brain tumor, BBTD. So in this case, we cannot easily treat this type of cancer only by EPR effect. So we need another strategy. So for tackle this issue, we conjugate the ligand on the surface of our polymeric myself. So in this case, we conjugate the cyclic one, because this specific binding to alpha V beta three and alpha V beta five integrin overexpressed on tumor vasculature and cancer cells. So then we again follow the behavior in brain tumor by our intervital microscopy. So in this case, the CRGD conjugated micelles are labeled with red fluorescence and non-targeted micelles are labeled with green fluorescence and then inject into the mice with brain tumor. So here is a in vivo laser conhopa microscopic image of brain cancer just after a five minutes injection of mixture of these two mice. So inside of the capillary is a merged color of yellow, but inside of the tumor is totally dark. However, after five hours, you clearly observe the red color in a brain tumor mass, and this is a quantitative result. Only the CRGD installed micelles can penetrate into brain tumor. So these two micelles, the physical chemical character is totally same, size is same. So you cannot explain this result by passive EPR effect. The mechanism is more active. That means that uh, the active trans, transcytosis, the uh, induced by integrating binding of this 
CRDD polymeric micellar systems. And eventually, we can have a higher anti tumor efficacy. This is a treatment of also topic glioblastoma. So, compared to the oxyplatin or non targeted micelles, CRGD micelles shows a much significant suppression of this intractable glioblastoma. And also, we are utilizing different types of ligands, many, many different types of ligands. And this is another example the targeting of sialic acid from cancer cells. So why sialic acids? So the tumor presents sialic antigens more frequently than oncogenes. And expression of sialic acid related with cancer progression and poor prognosis. And increased expression of sialic acid in hypoxia and metastasis and cancer stem cell populations. So we believe that the targeting the sialic acids is quite Missing. However, sialic acid is also present on red blood cells and luminal surface of red cells. So ligands or sialic acid targeting should be active after reaching to the tumors. Otherwise, it causes some problems. So we are focusing on the difference of pH in the extra tumor pH, it's 7.4, and intra tumor pH usually lower than 7.0. So we focused on phenylborate because we have been working on phenylborate for a long time period and uh, you know, already published several papers. That means that phenylboric acid shows a very enormous binding profile with sialic acids under acidic condition. So we decided to conjugate phenylborate on the periphery of polymeric micelles. So here is the binding affinity to various sugars. At pH 7.4, this is a standard uh, Borma plot. Uh, still, at the pH 7.4, the phenylborate shows the highest binding profile to sialic acids. However, also have, show some binding property to other sugar like galactose and mannose. However, at pH 6.5, that the pH corresponding to intratumoral environment the binding is almost almost specific to sialic acids. So this is a very simple ligand that shows almost specific binding to sialic acid at intratumoral conditions. And actually, here is a, a accumulation to cultured tumor cells. You see some red color here. And however, in the presence of free phenylborate, it's totally inhibited internalization. And if we chop this uh, sialic acid by enzyme, they also reduce the internalization. So that means that we do observe the phenylborate, uh, you know, the associated internalization into tumor cells. And this is a plasma clearance. And you can see here that both phenylborate micelles and control micelles exactly show the same blood clearance profile, that means that we can maybe the circumvent the interaction with blood cells and luminal surface under these circulating conditions. Then here is the accumulation to tumor. The both mice shows a nice accumulation to tumor by EPR effect. However, the phenylborate mice shows much longer retention in tumor presumably due to the binding of the sialic acid moieties in tumor cells. And this is a treatment of orthotopic melanoma. And compared to the protein, of course, the mice without ligand show some the significant efficacy. But by conjugating phenylborate, we can even increase the efficacy of the mice cells. So this is a very simple ligand, but may be useful for the treatment of this kind of sialic acid enriched tumor cells. And the advantage of my cell system is that uh, we can utilize many driving force, hydrophobic interaction, hydrogen bonding, metal complex formation, and of course, electrostatic interaction, which might be useful for the gene and oligonucleotide deliveries. And in the gene delivery, uh, all of you know that there are many barriers 
in the uh, uh, systemic route, the nucleus attack, and non-specific interaction with RES, and size should be better than less than 200, 100 nanometers to have a EPR effect, and targeting bind to, to uh, uh, ensure the targetability. And intracellular delivery, the intracellular internalization, and most challenge is that endosome escape. Otherwise, all nucleic acid may be degraded inside of the lysosome. So for this increasing the longevity in blood circulation, micellarization is quite uh, useful, quite attractive, because just mixing this plasmid DNA with oppositely charged block copolymer, we can spontaneously obtain the root shape artificial bias, as shown here. The size is very uniform, around 16 nanometers, with a very nice root shape structures. And just by it, you making this kind of structure, we can dramatically improve the blood circulation profile, which we can directly observe under in vivo microscopy. So in this experiment, we labeled platelets with green fluorescence and red fluorescence for polyplex. Now, plasma DNA polyplex without fluorescing glyco after injection, we significantly observe the aggregation the size corresponding to freight rates. And you can see here some yellow color. That means that these aggregates stick to the freight rates and eventually may cause thrombosis. That is a big problem. However, just by covering this polypex with fluorescent glyco, situation is totally different. Now, of course, you still observe the freight rates, but you see here the background is totally red, but no aggregation. So this is a direct observation of how fibrillation effectively works in uh, increasing the blood circulation profile of polyplex. The next issue is the endosome escape. So for this, we need to integrate the endosome escaping units into our polyplex systems with minimum cytotoxicities. So to, long, to make long story short, we found out that this very simple structure might be useful. This is a polyaspartamide with ethandiamine unit as a side chain. However, this is a simple structure, but quite effective. So under the physiological pH, that is only in the monoprotonated form, which shows a very limited interaction with plasma membrane. However, in the pH 5, it turns into double protonated state, which was a very significant interaction this endosomal membrane to disrupt the membrane integrity. So here is one example here. So this is a single cell, and green is a endosomal marker dextran. The red is plasmid DNA. So when polyplex was formed with polyrysin, which doesn't show any endosomal escaping capability, even after 24 hours, both dextran and uh, DNA are captured inside of the endosomal compartment. However, when we make a polyplex with PASP DT, that is a polymer with ethandiamine unit, we do observe the significant diff diffusion of plasmid DNA and dextran outside of the endosome. And we confirm this by release of cytoplasmic enzyme, LDH. So at the pH 7.4, when the ethandiamine unit is in a monoprotonated state, there is almost no LDH release. However, by decreasing pH to 5.5, we clearly observe the significant increase in the LDH release corresponding to the uh, in membrane disruption by double protonated uh, polymer structures. And this also compounded by hemolysis assay. So at the pH 7.5, or even increase the concentration of amino groups, we do not observe increase in the hemolysis, but at pH 5.5, we clearly observe the significant increase in hemolysis uh, corresponding to the increase in the amino group concentration. So that means that this is a mechanism, as I mentioned, that uh, in the extracellular pH 7.4, it shows a very limited interaction with plasma membrane, 
However, in a late endosome pH, it turns into double protonated state to disrupt the membrane structure to facilitate the polyplex release into the cytosol. And another important feature of this structure is this is self-catalyzed functions. So just hold this polymer in a phosphate buffer at physiological temperature, it spontaneously undergoes a self-degradation. And this is not observed for polyglutamate. So this is only for the polyaspartate uh, structures. And we follow this uh, uh, degradation process by mass spectrometry. And after two months, it completely degraded into monomer units. So this is a very nice depolymerization profile. And eventually, there is a reduced toxicity as expected. So this is a, a, a bio toxicity assay against Quebec. So XGM500, this is a polyethylene imine, is quite toxic. And TASP dead, that is a decreased toxicity, but still become toxic with increased concentration. However, the degrad degraded compound of PASP-DT doesn't show any toxicities. And also, we confirm this by injecting these compounds directly into animals to show, to examine the production of inflammatory cytokines. So IL-6 and TNF-alpha, there's no, no increase in this inflammatory cytokine production for degraded PASP DT. So that is quite safe. So we are utilizing this uh, structure to for the many kind of gene therapy. So this is just one example, the treatment of wet AMD. Because wet AMD always shows a, a development of colloidal neovascularization. And this vasculature has a very similar property to vasculature of tumors. That shows some kind of the EPR effect. So we prefer the, the uh, polyplex micelles loaded with plasmid DNA expressing soluble vegetable receptor, SFLT1, to prevent the angiogenesis. And this is a, uh, this is a systemic injection. And after systemic injection, we, add, we observe the model uh, AMD by laser uh, irradiation. And this is a, a AMD region. You can see here the significant decrease occurs after the treatment with this SFLT1 loaded polymeric micelles because of the anti-angiogenic efficacies. And we are more interested recently to utilize this for the messenger RNA delivery. So why messenger RNA? So of course, gene delivery is quite effective, but always a risk of the random integration. And usually, introduction into non-dividing cells are not so easy. So in case of the protein delivery, there is no risk of uh, integration, however, sustained production, sustained release is quite challenge. So theoretically, by utilizing messenger RNA, we, we can all overcome these problems. However, messenger RNA delivery is not widely used because of the two problems. The first problem is messenger RNA is very unstable under physiological conditions. And second problem is that the high immunogenicity the messenger RNA induced strong immune response through recognition by toll-like receptors. However, by packaging messenger RNA successfully into polymeric micelle structures, we can overcome these two problems. So here is one example. That is a direct injection of this messenger RNA-loaded polyplex micelle into brain stem. And we do observe the significant protein expression all over the CNS, that means the uh, central nervous systems. And this is quite promising data, which may be in a future application of this kind of system for the treatment of nerve disorder diseases. And issue is the, how is the immunogenicities? So we examine the production of inflammatory cytokines and interferons, IL-6, TNF-alpha, IFN-alpha-4, IFN-beta-1, after direct injection to brainstem. So when you inject 
the net naked messenger RNA, even after modification to reduce recognition, still you observe the significant increase in the production of inflammatory cytokines. However, just by package into polymeric micelles, as you can see here, we do observe the significant to reduce of this kind of immunogenicities. So in case of the IL-6, the, the level is almost same as VAPA. So that means that this result shows uh, this system quite safe for the application of in vivo delivery of messenger RNA by circumventing the recognition by four-like receptors. Maybe it should be better to stop at this moment or maybe almost okay. So or maybe the time is almost finished. So I just to uh, uh, give you one recent example, which is quite engineering. So as I mentioned, the endosome escape is very significant challenge. And of course, we can you know, solve this problem by chemical approach. But for the engineering approach, maybe we can utilize the uh, light to increase the gene transfection. That is a photochemical internalization. So for this purpose, we designed this uh, uh, triblock polymer, polypolysen glyco as outer domain to exert sterilness. The PASP DT as intermediate domain to load photosynthesizer, and polylysing as plasmid DNA binding core domain. And we just mix this block copolymer and plasmid DNA to form this three layered dot like polymeric polyplex micelles. The structure is like this. And then we mix this with this dendrimeric photosynthesizer with many carboxylic groups on the periphery to make this three layered polyplex micelles with nice dot shaped structures. The strategy is to, after systemic administration, these three layered micelles can accumulate in the tumor by EPR effect. And after internalization, there is a pH drop. And the pH drop uh, induce the protonation of carboxy group. Then this dendrima photosensitizer become hydrophobic and then translocate into endosomal membrane. And at this time, we give a light illumination to facilitate the endosomal escape. And we can observe this phenomena in the inside of the cell by super resolution microscopy. So here is uh, each of the endosomal lysosome. And this is a, a merged image of lysosome, photosynthesizer, and plasmid DNA. And we can enlarge the single endosome. The red color is plasmid DNA, and green color is endosomal membrane. And you see blue color is corresponding to the photosynthesizer accumulate into the endosomal membrane. And at this timing, we give a light illumination. And after several 10, 10, 10 to 20 hours, we do observe the GFP expression after light illumination, like here. And then we move into uh, in vivo study. Now after systemic injection of three layered micelles, we give a photo irradiation to tumor and resect the tumor and observe under the uh, uh, microscopy. So this is a result. Of course, without photo irradiation, there should be no GFP expression. But after photo irradiation, we clearly observe the significant gene expression selectively at the tumor irradiated with light. So this is the first success of the light-induced gene transfection after systemic administration. So this is the end of my uh, fantastic voyage. And I would like to express uh, thanks to all my, of my co-workers in my laboratory and uh, medical school. And of course, uh, thanks to uh, funding agencies. So thank you very much for your kind attention.